a material formed naturally over 400 million years ago and used in roofing all around the world. Slate can be found in many countries, but a vast chunk of it came from North Wales. And the chances are most old slate roofs emerged from the quarries they came from behind a little 040 industrial saddle tank built by the Hunslet Engine Company in Leeds. A bit like this one. Gwyneth wasn't the first of this design to be built, but as a product of 1883, she represents one of its earliest preserved stages. All the elements of the Quarry Hunslet formula can be found here. The four 20-inch driving wheels, the outside frames and cranks, the inside Stevenson valve gear, initially made from case-hardened Yorkshire iron, the tiny 120 psi boiler, later increased up to 160 psi on some examples, tall safety valves over the firebox, and no cab. You might assume the Quarry Hunslet is as basic as milk, where we just associate it with being one thing for one job. But just like milk, there are many different types of Quarry Hunslet which are similar, yet they're all slightly different. <clears throat> it tastes slightly different and all. Has a picture ever been more tranquil than this? A quarry hunslet on a line of slate wagons through the Welsh countryside. But it hasn't always looked like this. Customers for these engines included the Ridlington Colliery Network in Somerset, the Groby Granite Company in Leicestershire, and the Bold Venture Lyman Store Company in Derbyshire. Other early customers ranged from Kettering to Cornwall, but the two most famous and influential stamping grounds were a pair of slate mining networks in North Wales, De Norwick near Llanberis, and Penryn near Bangor. Both of these networks had a quarry at one end and a port at the other, with the little engine shunting around on one foot 10 and 3 quarter inch gauge track. Although with the Penryn system, it kind of depends who you ask. De Norwick received their first Hunslet 040 saddle tank, Charlie, or De Norwick as she was originally called, all the way back in 1870. And according to the Engineer magazine, she could haul 30 tons at 12 miles an hour. Doesn't sound that impressive, but as the design evolved, future examples could handle 125 tons on the level, 60 tons up 1 in 100, and 35 tons up 1 in 50. The design generally featured the same cylinder blocks and wheel sets, but boilers, tanks and frames differed throughout development. As a result, there were nine official types of quarry hunslet. There was the Alice, the early de Norwick port type, the later de Norwick port type, the tram road, otherwise known as the mills, the Penryn small quarry, large quarry, port, granite quarry, and a trio of unique ones simply known as large. As rival firms, De Norwick and Penryn wouldn't want their hunslets to be exactly the same, so the differences, like boiler types and how high they sat in the frames, were subtle. Some of them were fitted with large oak wooden blocks on the buffer beams to prevent buffer locking at low speeds, especially when going around curves with a radius as tight as 21 feet. But let's be honest, because all of these hunslets came from the same factory to more or less the same design, it's easy for the casual eye to assume they're the same in all but colour, even though they're obviously not. Let me put it into words that the internet age can understand. This is Casper. He's a cross between a Persian and a Maine Coon, and he's got long hair, usually, a laid-back attitude, and a big face. Whereas his son Mango is a bit different. He's got the hair and the attitude, as you can see, but his mother was a tortoiseshell, so his face is a bit smaller. 
So even though there are differences, it's easy for people to assume they came from the same bloodline. They behave differently too. An Alice type typically weighs around the same as a Penryn small quarry class, with the same size of cylinders, wheels and wheelbase on roughly the same size of chassis. But with a difference of 20 to 40 psi in the boiler pressure, it's possible for the Denorwick type to have an extra 300 pounds of tractive effort at the wheels. The two Mills examples, named Jerry M and Kakla, weighed 11 and 3 quarter tons and boasted just over 4,000 pounds of tractive effort. The trio of large 040 saddle tanks were built for the backbone of trains on the Penryn Quarry route, Charles of 1882 and Linda and Blanche of 1893. Technically the oldest of these is the oldest surviving quarry hunslet in preservation. But their story is one for another time. Meanwhile, back to the Little Ones. Names of North Welsh Hunslets were typically of North Welsh origin, but there were some that were named after racehorses competing in the Grand National, such as Cloister and Covetcoat. Others would carry names in memory of local personalities, such as George Sholto and Edward Sholto, named after the father and son peerage members who owned the Penryn estate. The beauty of this design was that it could be worked by one man instead of two. Sounds like a recipe for disaster, which it would be if you were handling a top link express train between major cities hundreds of miles apart, but in a quarry, journeys were normally a few hundred yards at a time. Speed wasn't essential unless you wanted to spend your whole life putting things back on the rails, and loads, while still weighing tons at a time, were nowhere near as high as any of the standard gauge companies were used to. So none of these engines really needed someone constantly piling tons of coal on the fire. If they did, then they would run out very quickly, as they could only carry between one and a half and three hundred weight of coal, which in metric terms is barely 75 to 150 kilos. It was also possible to raise steam on one of these in 45 minutes, under the right circumstances of course. Fires were cleaned out, but rarely dropped altogether. So at the end of a day's work, these engines were being put to bed with 20 to 30 PSI still on the clock. But don't worry, they needed 50 PSI before they could run away. But don't misunderstand, Penryn and Denorwick weren't the only Welsh quarries to receive one of these. No fewer than seven other Welsh-based firms took delivery of quarry hunslets. Just don't expect me to say them out loud without getting them wrong. One of these quarries received one of the most unique variants of the whole quarry hunslet catalogue. Built in 1891, Lilla was based around a combination of the Alice and the Mills types. With 8.5 by 14 inch cylinders and 26 inch driving wheels, she boasted a tractive effort of nearly 3,800 pounds. Subsequently, she could haul up to 200 tons on the flats. From being the most mass-produced of Hunslet's catalogue, there's no denying the little quarry locos became one of their most popular, albeit far from the most problem-free. There's just two and a half square feet of grate behind that firehole door. Now they were only built for shunting in short bursts, so firing was fairly easy. But for longer runs with more weight behind you, you may want to be a bit more on your toes. An A2 sheet of paper covers more space than this, and this could cause problems when lighting up, 
A small boiler with low heating surface could result in more time to light one of these engines up from cold. Now you could counteract this problem by attaching an artificial blower, as many narrow gauge locomotive owners tend to do. But in the late 19th century, there was no such thing. No wonder the fires were rarely dropped. Many Hunslets had their chimneys cut down in order to fit through tunnels, which made drafting even worse. Their water capacity wasn't exactly high either. Between 100 and 150 gallons is usually fine for short bursts of work, but in preservation, you better make sure you have a constant supply. It's possible to run one of these the entire length of the Festiniog Railway in North Wales in less than one hour and 20 minutes, but it would either need a water carrier or to stop and refill at every chance it could get. And on those with a cab, the safety valves needed extending to prevent infiltrating the cab with hot, wet steam. And no, that's not a euphemism for something else. And despite being of the same design and sometimes of the same class, even individually they were all a little different. One of the old Hunslet factory workers said these engines were being made by blacksmiths, not precision engineers, which basically meant, of course, that components were often tailor-made for every loco, so each one turned out a little bit different from the last. Now, if you wanted to interchange bits between engines, you still could, but it was very often a case of, if you want something to fit, then it's up to you to make it fit. Life on one of these wasn't even that lucrative. In 1940, a fireman's weekly wage at De Norwich was just 14 shillings and ninepence. In 2024, that would barely be worth around 37 pounds. Still, pays better than YouTube does. Over 50 years later, this Victorian design was still being delivered new to North Wales quarries. But much like Queen Victoria herself, Hunslet's little saddle tanks had a shelf life. As time went by, more modern locomotives were supplied by firms like Bagnall, Barclay, Avonside, Kerr Stewart, and Peckett. Many Hunslets worked alongside their contemporaries, but old age and changing times would inevitably lay them up. Hunslet made their final late Dinorwick port engine in 1932, by which time the Welsh slate trade was already in decline. While rival steam engines poised a threat, internal combustion and battery locos would eventually kill them all off. But while some of them, like the two examples that went to Moyle Truffin Quarry, were scrapped, the majority of them were much more fortunate, being saved by railway enthusiasts of the 1950s and 60s. In those days, it was possible to buy a quarry Hunslet for the modern equivalent of less than a thousand pounds. In January 1965, a report on the BBC's Tonight programme helped to boost interest in the remaining steam engines on site at Penryn. Word has it the quarry received over a hundred inquiries off the back of the broadcast. So to anyone who says content doesn't help railway preservation, it seemed to help in 1965. So, where did they end up after a lifetime in the quarries? Some of them ended up in private collections. Those at Hollycombe and Thursford took the two Mills examples, Jerry M and Cackler, respectively. Some ended up in museums, showing the masses what they looked like in as-built and as-withdrawn condition. But of course, railway preservation offers up a great magnitude of quarry hunslets at work. It's possible to find a North Wales Hunslet a long way from home, such as Gwyneth, a Penryn port type of 1883, 
settling down at Bressingham Steam Museum in Norfolk. This place offers no fewer than four demonstration lines, the longest of which being the two-foot gauge Nursery Railway. Opened in 1972, this two and a half mile circuit can add up to 3,000 miles a year to an engine's workload. Nearer to their origins, railways at Lamberis Lake and Barla Lake have been using quarry hunslets as their main motive power since the early 1970s. There were some initial concerns about such tiny shunting engines running longer distances, but seeing as neither route has constant heavy gradients, these concerns seem to have been quickly crushed. Then there's the Launceston Steam Railway, one and three quarter miles of two foot gauge track running on part of the old standard gauge North Cornwall system between Barnstable and Wadebridge. One of Launceston's long term residents, Covert Coat of 1898, has been fitted with a bespoke tender to increase fuel capacity. Some of them even went beyond the UK. Winifred of 1885 ended up being exported to North America with various other Penryn locos. She was repatriated in 2012, and like most Penryn examples, her gauge was modified to two feet to make her more compatible with today's heritage railways. And let's not forget about the odd one out. After transfer to the Penryn system in 1928, Lilla spent the rest of her life shunting in the quarries, until preservation in December 1963. After a few spells in private hands, she moved to the Festiniog Railway in 1993. She may not be the most regularly used amongst the Englands and the Fairleys, but with a water capacity of 220 gallons, she has an easier time of traversing the line than a normal Hunslet. And remember I said that Hunslet made their final Quarry 040 saddle tank in 1932? Well, that's not entirely true. In 2005 and 6, two more Quarry Hunslets were constructed at Statfold Barn near Tamworth. The Hunslet trademark was bought out in 2004, with the new engines, Statfold and Jack Lane, being based along the lines of the De Norwick Port class. When you round up the number of all surviving quarry Hunslets, it's amazing to think that so many still exist. If you include the Penryn mainline trio, and the new ones, there's about 40 out of 54 quarry hunslets in preservation, nearly 75% of the whole fleet. But that doesn't seem to make them generic. Unlike the Black Fives or Bully Pacifics, there aren't masses of people jabbing at their keyboards wondering if there's too many of these things preserved. If anything, people have spent more time celebrating the Quarry Hunslets in preservation. And why wouldn't they? I mean, they're small, they're cheap, they're easy to run, they're quicker to overhaul than a garret, and at places like Barla Lake, Launceston, Statfold, Bressingham and so on, they've proven as dependable as they are likeable. If Heritage Railways hit hard times, it'll be easier and cheaper to fire one of these up than a bullied. And when you see them in action, how could you not?
There are those who say that narrow gauge railways are more intriguing than standard gauge, and when you look through the Quarry Hunslet's history, it quickly becomes easy to see why. There are so many variations within the variations that even identical ones quickly become unique. But there's no denying that this design has become one of the most celebrated narrow gauge designs of all time. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. If you like what you see and you'd like to see more, then feel free to like this video, share it amongst your friends, subscribe for more content, and discuss it in the comments or on social media. What's more, there's a whole back catalogue of over 50 episodes of Steam Locos in Profile available exclusive on Patreon. From as little as £3.50 a month, you can gain access to new videos up to a month in advance. Higher contributions get you the whole catalogue and feature length and behind the scenes content. Or alternatively, Steam Locos in Profile is available on DVD and digital download from e-gmedia.co.uk forward slash shop. Thanks a lot for watching, and don't ever stop being awesome.